So this will be the second video of three, um, which will cover the neurotransmitters and cells in the nervous system within the fourth part of unit three of higher human biology. So for this, we initially need to know the structures of neurons um, and how those interconnect within the nervous system. So if you understand that, then I'll just crack on. So these two parts should be very basic drawings of two neurons. Okay, so what I've done is I've got a neuron here showing cell body and then an axon coming down. And then this area I've circled is a synapse. And this is what I'm going to zoom in on. Okay, so this is actually shown a synapse within a neuron pathway. We hear a neural pathway. Now, because the impulse goes from a cell body down an axon and then to the next neuron, so it goes from dendrite, cell body, axon, this impulse will be passing down the way. Okay, so it's important to acknowledge where that direction of impulse would be going. So this is your direction of impulse. Now there are a few things that we'll need to label before I start going, um, going on and describing what's going on here. So first of all, because this is before the synapse, okay, so this is a synapse here, or what's known as a synaptic cleft. This is the one before the synapse because this is the direction of impulse going from here down. So this is the presynaptic neuron because it's before the synapse. Okay, and in terms of what part of the neuron it is, it's the axon that's leading from the cell body down the way. So this is an axon. So this is an axon of the presynaptic neuron. Okay, now an axon from one neuron feeds into the dendrite of the next neuron. So this is the dendrite and specifically of the postsynaptic neuron because it's after that synapse. Okay, now there's another couple of things that you need to be able to label and recognize. So this would like to hope that you'd um, be able to recognize that and the fact that that's a mitochondria. Now, in the previous video, I talked about the fact that mitochondria are there to provide energy for the impulses passing down. Okay, They're also there to provide energy for protein synthesis, which is actually a big um, part of this whole synaptic cleft part um, of the course. Right, and then the last thing you'll really be able to need to label before I start getting into detail on this um, is this thing here. Now, that thing here is a receptor. Okay, notice how you only have receptors on the postsynaptic neuron, on that end membrane of that dendrite. Alright, so these are the parts that you need to be able to label, um, as well as one additional part which I've not covered yet because I've not described it yet. Okay, so in terms of what goes on when a neurotransmitter has to pass across the synapse, there's quite a number of stages, so this is quite a good essay question because there are so many parts to it. Okay, so because of that, I've got a step-by-step -step, um, instructional kind of guide on how this works. So, um, before I do that, I'll just label one more part, because you will need to know this when it comes to labeling. Um, so this here, this little sphere, is what's known as a vesicle. Okay, now in neurons, vesicles contain neurotransmitters. Okay, now we already know some examples of neurotransmitters. We know um, acetylcholine for one thing um, and noradrenaline for another. So when it comes to this um, synaptic cleft, basically what you need to get is the impulse passing from this neuron over to the next neuron. Now from National 5, you know that that's done by chemicals. But those chemicals are neurotransmitters. Okay, so now rather than calling it chemicals, you would call it specifically neurotransmitters. So when an impulse passes down this neuron, Okay, what it does is it activates these wee vesicles. Okay, so a nerve impulse stimulates those neuron, uh, those um, vesicles that are containing neurotransmitters. Okay, 
So it passes down that axon and it stimulates lots of vesicles. I've only drawn one here, but there will be multiple, okay? Lots of vesicles that would then start to move down this neuron. Okay, so those vesicles move down that neuron because of that impulse. And they move to what's called the presynaptic membrane, which is the membrane at the end of this axon that's before the synapse. Okay, so these vesicles move down. And then ultimately what they do is they fuse with the membrane at the end of this axon. And when they do, and they fuse with it, they release the neurotransmitters that they're holding. Okay, and they release it into that synaptic cleft. Okay, so these little dots that I'm drawing here are neurotransmitters being released. Okay, so they fuse with that membrane and then they're released into that synaptic cleft. So make sure that when I'm saying they, I should be more specific, you're stating that the vesicles fuse and then they release the neurotransmitters into that synapse. Okay, so if you think about this process, there is a high concentration of neurotransmitter here and a low concentration over here because there's none yet. Okay, so when substances move from a high concentration to a low, that is diffusion. So therefore they diffuse across the cleft. Okay, so in terms of stages and for numbered stages, I'm just going to add the numbers here. Okay, so this is number one. Okay, where a nerve impulse passes down that neuron and it triggers vesicles to move. Those vesicles then move and fuse with the presynaptic membrane. The third one is that they're released in the synaptic cleft. And then the fourth point is that they move across by diffusion. So the neurotransmitters move across that synaptic cleft by diffusion. Okay, now the point of this is that you want to get the neurotransmitters across the neuron or across the synaptic cleft to bind to these receptors. Okay, so that's exactly what I'm showing in this doodle here, is that the neurotransmitters are binding to these receptors. Okay, and that's what point five is. So neurotransmitters bind to the receptors on that postsynaptic neuron, on the membrane of that postsynaptic neuron, um, which would be a dendrite of that. Now, as a quick point, this could also be a muscle fibre, and I'm going to come on to that in a minute. Okay, but neurotransmitters bind to receptors. Now, these receptors have a function to play. They can determine whether a signal is excitatory, which basically means that it increases action, or inhibitory, right? And you remember the um, inhibiting from before. So inhibitory means to decrease action. Okay, so in an essay question, just stating that Receptors determine whether a signal is excitatory or inhibitory would get you a mark. You wouldn't need to explain what those mean. All right. Now you've got your impulse. It's passed down this neuron, okay, down this axon. It's triggered the release of neurotransmitters into that synaptic cleft, and then they've bound to these receptors on the presynaptic, uh, postsynaptic neuron. Sorry. Okay. Now once that's happened, that stimulates an impulse to pass down this neuron, and it's basically transmitted that impulse. So it's passed that whole impulse across. Okay, so it's moved across that synaptic cleft and then caused this neuron to then pass that impulse down itself. Okay. Now, your body has to be quite efficient about how it works with this. So what it has to do then is to prevent continuous stimulation, to prevent that neuron from constantly being stimulated and told to have an impulse, what you need to do is remove this neurotransmitter. Right, and there's a couple of ways you can do that. So you can either remove it by enzymes. Okay, that will then break this neurotransmitter down and then allow the product to be reabsorbed back into that cell and used to make more neurotransmitters for next time. Or it can be taken back in by reuptake. Okay, which is basically where you just get reabsorbed back into that neuron. Okay, into that presynaptic neuron. So seven is essentially that stuff being broken back down and taken back into that neuron. All right, so I did say I was going to come on to the next part, um, which is whether this 
in this um, synaptic cleft example, we've got two neurons. But a synaptic cleft can also be between a neuron and a muscle fibre. Okay, so what I've got here is a quick doodle of a muscle fibre. Now note that the setup is really similar. Okay, this is a muscle fibre here, which I'll label. And these little parts here are your receptors. Okay, now your neurotransmitter would then diffuse across the synaptic cleft and then bind to these receptors and then trigger a response. Okay, now it would actually trigger that muscle fibre to contract. That would be the impulse. The, the, well, the impulse would cause that. Okay, because it's an electrical, an electrical impulse. Now there's a couple of points that you could be asked about in this. And one of them is the function of the mitochondria. Now in this, the mitochondria provides energy. For that electrical impulse. Or it provides energy for the production. Of neurotransmitters or enzymes to then break that stuff down. Okay, you can equally be asked why this would have a large number of ribosomes. And that's the same idea, is to then allow it to produce neurotransmitters or allow it to produce the enzymes that would then break those neurotransmitters down. Or even to produce them, um, ah, to produce those enzymes. Now in this question it could ask you, why would there be a high level of mitochondria in this muscle fibre? So that muscle fibre would have lots of mitochondria, not because it needs energy for the impulse, but because it needs energy to contract. Okay, so don't forget the basics when it comes to these questions. Right? Now they can also ask you that same question about why these would have lots of mitochondria um, in this example. Okay, with the postsynaptic neuron. So this would have lots of mitochondria. Right? either for energy for that impulse or for energy for production of neurotransmitters, the same as the previous one. Okay. And it would have lots of ribosomes. Okay. So function of the ribosomes then would be for the production of either the enzymes. Um, so for this, for example, it'd be the production of the enzymes or the neurotransmitter. But for this side, it'd be for the production of the receptors, because remember, receptors are proteins. Okay, so I'm probably just going to give you a more detailed example for the ribosomes for this one. Just so you would know how to answer that. So ribosomes there for production. of enzymes or neurotransmitters. Now think about the link between this and the nuclei as well. Okay, remember the enzymes and receptors and neurotransmitters, they're all made of proteins. So think about that link to the nucleus. That nucleus would contain DNA and that would contain genes that would then control the production of those enzymes or those proteins. All right, so I'm gonna move on to the next part which is about what's called the threshold. Um, so the threshold is a term that you might already know um, and you might have heard about, just very conversationally. So a threshold tends to be a limit. Okay, and that's pretty much exactly what a threshold is when it comes to neuron pathways as well as neuron pathways. So with this, with the whole of the, um, the nerve impulse transmission, nerve impulse can only be transmitted across the synapse if there's enough of those neurotransmitters to cause an impulse in the next neuron. Okay, so you need enough neurotransmitter molecules. Now the term for that, that level, that enough, okay, is called the threshold. Right? So if you produce a little bit, okay, of neurotransmitter, if the stimulus is weak and it does not require a response, doesn't require an impulse to be transmitted, it wouldn't produce enough neurotransmitter to reach that 
okay? So the minimum number of neurotransmitters that a molecule, um, neurotransmitter molecules that would have to attach to receptors right, would be called its threshold. So there's a certain level that a neuron would have that would then mean that it would have to meet before an impulse would be triggered. Okay, that's the threshold. Now, this is really difficult to kind of word and to explain until I show you a diagram. So I'm going to show you this and take this stuff away. So before I kind of show you this in a diagram, I'll explain a couple other points. So if you've got a weak stimulus or a weak stimuli, it won't be enough to reach the threshold. It won't produce enough neurotransmitter to re reach the threshold. So what you can do is have lots of axons releasing just a little bit of neurotransmitter to then add up to essentially enough to meet that threshold. So if you then add a little bit, but add lots of little bits, it can reach that threshold. Okay. So that is known when you have enough of those weak stimuli that you produce a lot of little bits. Okay. This is known as summation. Okay, now I've got a diagram here because it's much easier to show you when it comes to a diagram. So this here is an axon. Okay, this here is a dendrite. Okay, and here is a synapse. Okay, pre-synaptic neuron, post-synaptic neuron. And that impulse is carrying itself from the axon down to the next dendrite of the next neuron. Okay, and I'm just showing you this zoomed in here. Okay, so this is the dendrite. And these are axons. Now it might be that, say for example, this axon only produces three molecules of neurotransmitter. Okay, that's four dots, but it's three, right? So we've got five coming from this, right? And just for talking sake, we want to see, is that going to then cause an impulse? Is it going to reach the threshold? Now I'm going to tell you that this dendrite, this neuron here, has a threshold of 20. Okay, now this is not obviously how it works in terms of numbers. It's a massive, massive number, but just for talking sake, I'm going to demonstrate it like this. So if you get a little bit of neurotransmitter molecule from this and this, okay, these two axons, it's not going to be enough to reach that threshold of 20. Okay, it's not enough neurotransmitter binding to these receptors to then reach that threshold to cause an impulse to pass down this dendrite. But if you have all these other axons adding in a little bit, That's more than enough to reach that threshold. So you don't just have to have one axon and one neuron feeding in that would feed enough neuron and uh, neurotransmitters in to reach the threshold. You would have multiple that would feed in. So that's a cumulative effect. Okay, you add all these up. Okay, and it's a series of weak stimuli. Okay, that would then eventually trigger a response and trigger an impulse. Okay, that's known as summation. Okay, so this is the threshold. And summation is when you've got all these axons having a cumulative effect of a little bit of neurotransmitter. Okay, now the common question that comes up with this is that this often occurs, summation often occurs in convergent pathways. Okay, where you get lots of neurons feeding into one neuron. Okay, that will then take all those neuron um, neurotransmitters from all those neurons and pull it down to cause an impulse. Okay, and that summarizes the neurotransmitters at a synapse part.